two-year master's level program focused on educating future biomimicry professionals around the globe. She is an Illinois licensed architect and maintains her lead accredited professional professional with building design and constructing credentials. Please help me welcome Amy Coffin Phillips. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you so much for coming out, and thank you to Bioneers for giving me the opportunity. Um, at first, um, we're actually going to switch things up, and I am actually going to follow Janine Benyus, who is our plenary speaker from Biomimicry, from the last Bioneers. She wrote a book called Biomimicry back in 1997, and it launched a movement that has inspired designers like me to really rethink how we design and build and organize in this world. She co-founded a group called the Biomimicry, called Biomimicry 3.8, and that is founded as a social enterprise and innovation consultancy, working with companies as wide-ranging as Nike and Boeing to seventh generation and architecture firm HOK. So in addition to that, they also founded, in 2005, they founded an institute, and that has trained people like me in to do exactly what they do, so that we can bring it to our own regions and our own countries and start understanding how we can apply nature's genius locally. Janine Benyus is an author, she's a biologist, she's a MacArthur Genius Fellow, and she will also describe a couple of the other awards that she's been given most recently in the video. She is an enthusiastic and passionate advocate for the field of biomimicry. So without any more further ado, I'd love for you to watch her video. Thank you. So this is Janine, and this was at one of the first trips that we took. It was, um, into, we went to Montana to visit, and so we, this is one of the, the two-year program that I did was actually seven different trips to seven different ecosystems. And, you know, so we got to meet all these people. These are some amazing people in my cohort. But I want to specifically single out Dr. Dana Baumeister. She is Janine's, the verb to Janine's noun is how they describe it. They co-founded the Biomimicry Institute and Guild. And she was the primary instructor that I learned from. And she has this innate ability to translate biological information and make it accessible to designers and business people and engineers like me. And I also wanted to introduce you to Peter Warshall. You notice the dedication at the end of Janine's speech. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet him and work with him or know who he is, he is Netherlands to 
Mexico, to Spain, all, and all parts of the United States. And we were all there together to learn together, multi-generational. Dana brought, brought her son with us, with Alexander, and you know, with people from, you know, that were maybe 10 years out of school all the way to people in their 60s. Multidisciplinary. It's designed as an interdisciplinary study so that you have biologists working with designers and ecologists and business people all working and collaborating to create projects. My family. Because after two years together and several trips and tons of projects, we truly became a family. And we still communicate with each other all the time on our phones through WhatsApp. So I, this program was truly a transformational experience for me. And I want to share with you what one of the things that we did while we were there. My collaborators, Maria Farrell, she is my, the biologist collaborator, and Lindsay James, who is my business collaborator, the three of us did a thesis project on resilience in business systems. And that was, we thought we would do some research, come up with some principles, write a white paper, you know, have something like that. And what we quickly realized is that while the principles are sound and the principles are fairly universal, the way that they're applied is highly context specific. So what works for me and my business may not work for you and yours. What works for one ecosystem may not work for the other. And so what we did was we created a workshop. And it's all about understanding and embedding, clients all about understanding and embedding this, these resilience principles into their own organizations, communities, and businesses. So that's what I want to focus on today, is just to share with you some of these principles that we've created, that we've distilled through um, starting with the life's principles, but also doing research and understanding uh, resilience thought leaders, so that you can start to embed them in your own lives and work. So, love this trait, right? So this tree amazing. My Maria, who I just showed you, she actually took this photo. And what I love about this tree is that it is, you know, you could have seen this fence as a barrier. But instead of doing that, it actually just was, it was no big deal at all. It just went straight through the fence. But not only did it not stop at the barrier, it actually leveraged that barrier to help support itself. It just grew around it like it wasn't even there. And so this idea of resilience, we really want to think about how we can embed nature's resilience into our own human systems so that they can be structured appropriately so that they can survive, adapt, and thrive through these disturbances. And we're really talking about this idea of really understanding what the function that we're trying to maintain is. What is really your core essence that you need to continue? So if you're thinking about communities, you might think of, you need clean water, you need food, you need shelter, energy. These are all the different functions that we need to maintain through disturbance. So what do we need to do? How do we need to structure ourselves ahead of time so that we're able to emerge with them? And so that our systems can do as well. So what are the different systems that we're talking about? Well, we have economies that are fragile. They are very efficient under certain parameters, but step outside those parameters. So if we're talking about climate change, whenever we have economy, whenever we have disasters, or you know, the economies have to be able to account for the rebuilding as well as the lost ecosystem services. We have increasingly disconnected communities that don't foster the social connection and ties that's inherent to resilience. And we have infrastructure that is static and unchanging and not as adaptable as it needs to be. And all of these systems are maladapted to a changing context. So what we're talking about with resilience is really how do we adapt ourselves to this changing context? And maybe start to rethink. So instead of fighting change, this is my son. Instead of fighting change and trying to you know, trying with all of our energies to try to stop change and prop up existing systems and rebuild in areas that maybe shouldn't be rebuilt. Maybe we should start to rethink and look to alternative sources of inspiration, like life. Life is inherently resilient. 
Think about the walk on the prairies that Leslie and I did today. And life survives through conditions that we would have a very difficult time doing so. And you all, life is also infinitely adaptable. The land that we are sitting on right now was once the primordial tropical sea, covered with a, cor with a coral reef, and then covered by a mile of ice as the, as the continent shifted, then forests, and then prairies. And now we've adapted it to our own needs, industrial farms, cities, houses. And so while these things are constantly changing, life has adapted and continues in all of these contexts. 0.1% of the species that have ever existed on this planet exist today. And they exist because they are the most well adapted and the most adaptable. Jimmy mentioned life's principles. And these are the overall patterns that we find in 99% of life on this planet. We can use this as innovation, innovative design strategies different ways that we can start thinking about how to adapt to changing conditions, to be locally attuned and responsive, use life-friendly chemistry, and so on. These, uh, this information is available in the Creative Commons. You just have to look up life's principles. And you'll have information, and you can use these toolkits. And so what we did when we started looking into nature's resilience is we used this as the foundation of our work, and then started building on it with primary biological literature and reading the thought leaders in resilience. We started distilling a suite of strategies that we wanted to, that we think have the ability to embed resilience into our own human system. And so what I want to do today, tonight, is just give you a brief glimpse into some of these strategies and how nature is resilient and how we can begin to think about how to do this in our own. So the first one is this idea of incorporating redundancy. A lot of times we think about redundancies in a bad way, that it's expensive, it's duplication, they just go to waste. But in nature, redundancies are inherent. They, you, you have a lot of different ways of doing the same thing. And by doing that, we are, it's able to have multiple components. So for example, in the tropical rainforests, there's a certain function, there's many functions that have to be maintained. And one of them is seed dispersal. So you have the frugivores, the fruit-eating animals, such as the flying, uh, two different species of flying fox and fruit pigeons. And after they did a study in Samoa, after a cyclone and a fire, two of the species had 90% die-offs, but one of the species had only 10% die-offs, and they were able to keep keep eating the fruit and keep the function of seed dispersal intact. So because there were multiple components doing the same function, they, that function was able to be maintained after disturbance. So we can start to think about how we can embed that into our own systems. You know, a lot of our energy generation is done through fossil fuels, nuclear, and a centralized grid. That centralized strategy is fragile, as we've seen after some of the blackouts. And so what the sustainability movement has started to do is actually embed resilience into that system by adding community wind, community solar, into home-based wind, or home-based solar and building and creative wind. And so by adding these multiple components doing the same things, you're not relying on one system. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. You're actually embedding resilience into the system. And you notice that the example with the, uh, with the solar panels, you know, a solar panel will work in the sun, it won't really work in the storm, but you know, the hydro and the wind still would. So because there are multiple components, but they're different, they're diverse, that diversity is key. Because to have a bunch of, you know, we saw after the, uh, the banking crisis of 2008, we had a lot of different banks, there's a lot of redundancy, but they were all doing the same thing. So there was no diversity. And then that when one product fell, they all fell. And so redundancy needs to be coupled, tightly coupled, with diversity. And so we, and we practice diversification all the time. You think about how you plan for retirement. 
you have about, I have a 401k, it's diverse, different stocks. I also have a house, I have some money in there, and then I also have kids. <laughs> and when I do these workshops, that always comes up, but that's some, you know, that's retirement strategies. They have kids that can take care of you. So you have a lot of different ways of planning for your security and your retirement. And so this diversity is inherent in nature, and we see this in our prairies, we see this in every ecosystem. Biodiversity, a biodiverse ecosystem is inherently resilient. If you think about the prairie, even in a small five acre restored prairie, you can have up to 200 species of grass and flower and lichen. And so you have cool season grasses that come out early and warm season grasses that come out later. You've got legumes, you've got the, um, you've got the flowers. And so some of them will do better in cooler weather, some of them will do better in warmer weather. Some will do better in drought, some will do better in times of wet, wet in wet times. But so even though the prairie will look different every year because the species are different, the species composition mix is different, but the function remains intact. And so that's what we're talking about when we have to talk about embedding this diversity. Multiple components doing the same thing in different ways. We can also think about what this means for our food system. Right now we have a lot of our food is coming from industrial agriculture, centralized monocultures of animals. But again, the, the sustainability movement is beginning to embed resilience into our food system by encouraging CSAs, farmers markets, permaculture, home gardens, urban rooftop agriculture, all of these different ways of producing the same it, the same function of having food is embedding resilience into our system. And the Land Institute, for any of you who've heard of them out in Salina, Kansas, they are actually looking to reimagine how we grow grains in, our, in, the, in the grain belt. And they're looking, instead of annual monoculture, which is basically an all-you-can-eat buffet for pests, to perennial polyculture growing many different kinds of, of wheat and like all at the same place, and perennials so that the roots can grow deep and hold the soil and hold the water so that we lessen the soil erosion. And also this idea of scale. You'll notice that I talked about different scales from centralized power to home-based um, solar panels from central, or from the grain belts and grain production to urban rooftop agriculture. Scale is really important. We need to be represented. All of the scales need to be represented. So, and this was really clearly illustrated by some of the coral reefs that are in danger. Because by through the process of overfishing, we've systematically removed some of the scales from these systems. So in a healthy coral, uh, coral reef, you will have a lot of different partners that all do a certain function. So in this case, it's the function of eating the algae. Because if the algae get too big, they don't taste good, nobody will eat it, the next thing you know, you don't have a coral settlement anymore, you have an algal settlement. And so in a healthy ecosystem, you'll have this all at different scales. You have a sea urchin and mollusks that will eat algae within a couple of centimeters a meter or two. Then you'll have the larger fish that will go hundreds to thousands of all the way to the turtles, which will circumnavigate the globe. And when you have all of these scales, they are mutually reinforcing and non-competitive, because they all have their own niche. And when you systematically remove them, the settlements will fail. We can also think about what this means for our communities. Has anybody seen Duke's Day Preppers? Not Geo? I haven't either, but this, this is kind of a scary slide right now. <laughs> But it, um, you know, we as homeowners, we kind of understand that, you know, we can go to ready.gov and we know that we're supposed to have five days of food and water, kind of batteries, radio, all that kind of stuff. But if we focus only on the individual scale, it's not going to, it's, it's a short-term strategy because what happens when the entire town is on fire? All that food and water in my basement isn't going to help. So it needs to be more than just the individual scale. We have FEMA. But we can't rely just on FEMA and the federal government because it's fraught with inefficiencies and delays. They're great. They will come around, but we need that middle scale. 
We need community resilience. We need to understand, we need connections with our neighbors on the block level, on the, uh, the city level, the neighborhood level, the suburbs, the region. All of these scales are absolutely inherent to embedding resilience into our society. Which also leads to collaboration. We tend to think of ourselves and of nature as you know, highly competitive. But in mature, e intact ecosystems, collaborations are actually the norm. Janine mentioned that in her talk. And she's writing a book on it now. So when we think about we have a really simple example of collaboration, we can think about the oak trees and the squirrels. And oak trees produce tens, if not hundreds of thousands of acorns. And they feed an entire ecosystem. And in the process of feeding that ecosystem, they are feeding their collaborators. They are feeding the jays and the squirrels, which are going to go hide all the, one, the extra nuts that they can't eat. And in the process of producing that many acorns, a few trees will germinate. That's enough to reproduce the species. And so these collaborative relationships, we can start to think about what that means for our economies. Have any, has anybody been to the plant in South Chicago? It's a really great incubator for this idea of industrial ecology. This idea that you can create the structure and provide the nutrients that these industries will co-locate. In this case, it's, it's a vertical farm. So it's all, all the different businesses are food. We have, they have tilapia and plants, and this is a great little closed loop that the, the fish pollute the water with nutrients for the plants, and the plants clean the water for the fish. And then they also have kombucha brewery, and a, well, they don't have a regular brewery yet, sadly, but hopefully they will soon. Um, and a commercial kitchen. And in this case, they're, all of that waste is going to feed an anaerobic digester, which creates biogas, which will run a turbine, creating a net zero energy. So in the process of eliminating waste out of the system, they're actually creating a system that is collaborative. And the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of setting small fires. This is a quote from, uh, from a book that I'm reading called Resilience right now. And it's all about this idea that how do we understand that something is actually working? We test it. And so and nature does this by setting, setting small fires and fire adapted ecosystems like our prairie and the forests. Their small fires are actually a feedback loop that weeds out the undergrowth, what's not working, sends the nutrients back into the system. We can start to think about how we can test our own systems. What feedback loops can we install into our feeding systems so that the, we can find out what's not working and fix it before it becomes, in the case of a forest fire, a ground fire that destroys the system. So this is just a sample, a very first idea, to give you an idea of how we're starting to embed. We can look to nature to inspire how we can create resilient systems, resilient communities, businesses, organizations, and infrastructure. Again, this was the basis that we created a workshop up on it, and it's really focused on three strategies of mitigation. How do you minimize the damage? How do you adapt to changing conditions? And how do you organize yourself so that after a major disturbance, you're able to reorganize and evolve? All with a goal that is inherent in biomimicry of life creating conditions conducive to life. So in the process of meeting our own needs, we ourselves, our human systems, our communities, our businesses, need to create the conditions not only for our own survival, but for the survival of every living thing around us. And this is truly restorative design. This is the way we can emulate life. The first one is the what she mentioned, the Genius of Place projects. 
I think, and a lot of, and I co-founded a network called Bible in the Chicago. And our initial project that we're really working on is this idea of understanding what it means to design, this specifically relates to architecture and to building, but what does it mean to design here in a locally attuned way? And the other thing is, um, you know, maybe it's just what I'm working with, but you know, I really do think that, you know, Biomembry started as a product design and then went to the built environment, and now I think it really is lending itself towards this idea of organizational structures. And how do we self-organize? How do we embed these strategies into our human systems? So the form, the process, and the system. And then if we can get all three of those, then we are really, really good for biomimicry and for the planet. Yes? How does your organization feel about GMOs? <laughs> um, on one hand, they, they're mimicking nature. On the other hand, they there are possibly unintended consequences way in the future. It's, I, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I, in my mind, GMOs are not mimicry. It's, it, I don't know, it, it's not at all biomimicry. It's, it's changing life, it's changing nature. And I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily get into that, so I'm not exactly, you know, I'm not an expert on GMOs by any means, but I know that I don't buy them. Yeah. Um, how would you explain the difference? Just a second, Jack. She's got a point. Oh, hi. <laughs> how would you uh, explain the difference between permaculture design or similarities to uh, biomimicry? You know, it's really interesting. I have very good friends that are, you know, permaculture design up in um, the Resiliency Institute out in Naperville where I live. I'm on their board, and they, it, it's highly related. You know, permaculture is specifically related to food, but then they will tell you, yes, I know, you give me that look, because they did the same thing. <laughs> they say, no, it's not about food, it's a, it's a way of life, it's a system. And there are, I mean, in, permaculture is very similar in that sense. You know, and I, I'm not, I don't have my PDC, I, so I, I know from learning from them about permaculture, and I've attended their workshops and things like that. But I know that, you know, just like pioneers and biomimicry and permaculture, we're all kind of saying a lot of the same things in different languages. And we're applying it where we, we're applying it to our own context. So as an architect, I can take permaculture, I can take biomimicry, and I can apply it to my context. And you might take permaculture and apply it to something else. And, you know, everyone else applies. But as long as, it doesn't really matter what we call it, right? It's, it's all kind of the same thing. So... In my mind, permaculture is about food, but I know Michelle and Jody would have my head, so maybe you can delete that. <laughs> so we have students in the audience. Oh, we have a oh, I, oh gosh, I can build it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're videotaping, um, so we oh, you. I see, I gotcha. Um, Amy, can you give us any examples of the Chicago area? Do you have, have you designed, or you know, is there is the group that you're working with is there any design of buildings um, with biomimicry? I, not that I would call biomimicry in Chicago. Um, there are I'm closely affiliated with um, people that work at HOK, the architecture firm, and I know that they have some projects. Um, there's one specifically in Haiti. Um, off the top of my head, but I know that they did that. And then the one that they kind of put up as the case study for biomimicry and architecture is the um, Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe. And that was designed off of termite mounts. And using, you know, stuff that we know, stack effect, passive ventilation, um, thermal cooling and heating. These are, you know, in a lot of ways, it, you know, it, it's nice to have a building that you could say is biomimicry, but as long as you bring in components of it, you know, at this point, it, you know, biomimicry and products is a little bit simpler because you can prototype and you can test, and then you have this thing. Mm -hmm. And with buildings, it's hard to integrate unt unt untested products into the buildings. And so it definitely is coming. There is, HOK put out this really great report called The Genius of the Biome, and it's available free online. So if you just type, it, type in HOK, Genius of the Biome, it's a 120-some-odd page report that all is the different strategies and potential applications.
patients. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to understand the temperate deciduous forest, this is that particular biome, and understand how to build in that area. And they are implementing it in different parts throughout their buildings, but you know, in particular, could you say one is exactly a biomimic biomimicry building? It would be, you know, I'd have to defer to them on that. There's also a really great book, um, Michael Paulin, P-A-W-L-Y-N, wrote a book called Biomimicry and Architecture. And he has got some great proposals in that book as well. So if you were all interested in biomimicry applied to the built environment, Genius of the Bio, Biomimicry and Architecture by Michael if you were going to uh, encourage students today um, that are interested in architecture and center and building, what, what would you encourage them to take? You mean architecture students? Or any students that are interested in biomedical, what would you encourage them to take? Um, I would encourage them to get involved in the student design challenge. I don't think it's too late to sign up. Um, I know that they, it follows the calendar year of the school, so it started in September, it ends in May. But I know they were taking sign-ups, and what the Student Design Challenge is, is all around, Janine mentioned it in her prompt, in the, and that was about water, this year is about transportation. So if you sign up for the Student Design Challenge, you have a wealth of resources that you have access to. It, it's a minimal amount to sign up, it doesn't cost very much, I'll, I can't remember off the top of my head. It doesn't cost very much to sign up. And you just, it, it, all of the life's principles, all of this information, it's a really great primer. And it's written specifically for university students so that they can begin to solve these challenges. This particular year is about challenge of transportation and how can we look to nature to improve our transportation structures. That's what I would do. And you can always buy Jane's book. <laughs> Very easy to remember. Any other questions? No more questions? Well, I really want to thank Amy Kaufman Phillips for coming up here tonight.